the mood is somber. The disciples notice the faraway look in the eyes of Jesus. Something has him preoccupied. Jesus continually teaches on some sort of imminent death and something about a resurrection. This cannot be. The Messiah is not to die. He is to establish the new kingdom of Israel. At least that's what the Pharisees teach. We know because it's taught in our synagogues that the Messiah will remain forever. These may have been the thoughts of the disciples trying to understand the concept of the imminent death of Jesus. During the final three months of the ministry of Jesus, he prepared his disciples for his death and for their future responsibilities in his kingdom. No doubt, these were sober, serious months of quiet obscurity because the nation of Israel rejected Jesus. The only exception to this retreat was the resurrection of Lazarus. This miracle clearly revealed the messianic authority of Christ. The Sanhedrin could not deny this sign of Christ's authority. Therefore, they united in their plot to kill Jesus. This illegal execution became the official position of the Jewish religious order. According to John, six days before the Passover, Jesus journeyed to Bethany, approximately eight miles from Jerusalem, with his disciples. It is common knowledge among Bible scholars that the Bethany narrative recorded in John is the proper chronological order, while the narratives recorded in Matthew and Mark are not in proper chronological sequence. While Jesus was in Bethany, he entered the house of Simon the leper for Sabbath supper. Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary, were in the house also. And during the supper, Martha served the guests at the table while Mary took a pint of very expensive spikenard, a perfumed ointment, and anointed the feet of Jesus. Why did Mary do this? Why waste such an expensive perfume? Mary may not have known the reason for this ministry, but Jesus clearly understood. Mary was being used by the Holy Spirit to anoint Jesus for his burial. Judas Iscariot had his own opinion about the ministry provided by Mary. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. It's interesting to note that the ministry of Martha did not offend Judas. But the ministry of Mary did offend him, because the ointment could have been sold for 300 denarii and put into the common money bag. This amount of money was the equivalent of the yearly wage for unskilled labor or a common soldier in Israel. After the horrors of the Passion Week and the suicide of Judas, the disciples discovered that Judas was a thief during their entire ministry with Jesus. Judas sought to serve Christ with an unrepentant attitude, and this is not possible. The King James Version of the Bible indicates that Judas Iscariot was Simon the leper's son, but no other translation includes this phrase, nor do the earliest Greek manuscripts support this insertion. Was Judas Iscariot the son of Simon the leper? No one knows for sure, but does it matter? Because Judas was still a thief at heart. Jesus, obviously embarrassed by the tantrum of Judas, said, Let her alone. 
Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me ye have not always. Jesus rebuked Judas and the other disciples for their covetous attitude, because Mary was being obedient to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to anoint Jesus for his burial. It's apparent from the record of this incident in the Synoptic Gospels that Judas, being stung by this rebuke, slipped out and bargained with the chief priests to betray Jesus. John recorded that on Sunday, several people came to Simon's house to see Jesus and Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Because of the miracle of Lazarus, many of the Jews believed on the Lord Jesus. And for this reason, the Sanhedrin plotted to put Lazarus to death also. On Monday morning, Jesus dispatched two of his disciples, probably Peter and John, to Bethpage on a mission. Matthew chapter 21, verse 1 through 3. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Jesus instructed his two disciples to use his messianic title of Lord should they be challenged by the owner of the donkey colt. King David introduced this messianic title in Psalms 110 verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. No doubt, the use of this title would create a tremendous stir among the people of Bethpage. And like wildfire, the message spread from Bethpage to Jerusalem. The Gospel of Matthew states that this incident with the colt is the fulfillment of two Old Testament prophecies. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 11 The Lord has made proclamation to the ends of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your Savior comes. See, his reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Thus began a procession that would take Jesus from Bethany over the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley and into the city of Jerusalem. There could be no doubt what this procession indicated to the citizens of Jerusalem. Jesus riding on the foal of a donkey was presenting himself to the nation as the fulfillment of Zechariah's vision, the coming Messiah. Should this be true, then the next verse of Zechariah chapter 9 is also valid. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10 I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Should the prevailing Pharisaic interpretation be correct then this was the day when the chariots and war horses would be taken from Jerusalem and the battle bow would be broken. The Messiah would proclaim a peace that would extend to the ends of the earth. No doubt, the days of Rome were at an end, or were they? 
How many people were in Jerusalem for the Passover who witnessed this event? According to the writings of Josephus, the number of lambs sacrificed during the Passover celebration of 33 AD was 256,500. Figuring one lamb for every five to 10 people, we can project that approximately 1.5 million to 3 million people attended the Passover in Jerusalem. This number equates to approximately one half the population of Judea and Galilee combined. There can be no doubt, the nation rejected and killed Jesus, not just the Sanhedrin. As Jesus approached Jerusalem, multitudes lined the roads with palm branches, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, and they spread their cloaks on the road before the donkey. There can be no doubt that the assembled crowds realized that this incident was a fulfillment of the messianic prophecy recorded by Zechariah. The multitudes were also shouting portions of Psalms 118 verse 25 through 26. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. According to the custom of Passover, this portion of Psalms was chanted to the visitors who entered Jerusalem. Such statements like, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and the Son of David, and blessed be the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord, clearly indicates that the multitude knew Jesus was presenting himself as the Messiah. It's obvious that the crowds believed Jesus would become their political king, who would establish his political kingdom and deliver them from Rome. The shouting of the crowd offended the Pharisees who witnessed the procession to Jerusalem. Luke chapter 19, verse 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. This was the day of divine visitation, and even the stones realized that their Messiah was passing by. Would Jerusalem recognize their Messiah? Would they understand the day of their divine visitation? According to the narrative recorded in Luke, Jesus knew that the nation would reject him, even though they shouted praises of his Messiahship. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus understood that Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah riding on the donkey colt could usher in a period of peace that would spread to the ends of the earth. Jesus wept because the celebrant crowds did not understand that he offered them peace, the very peace they sought for. There is an implied condition located between the event described in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and the world peace promised in verse 10. And that condition is acceptance of the Messiah and his message. Jesus knew that Jerusalem would reject his offer of peace, and this spiritual blindness sealed their doom. The destruction that Jesus prophesied did occur during the siege of Jerusalem by Rome in 70 AD. 
This destruction came as a result of Jerusalem not knowing the day of their visitation. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he surveyed the temple complex. When Jesus looked around, his eyes would take in the booths of the money changers and the sellers of doves. Since it was late in the day, Jesus returned to Bethany for the night. It is interesting to note that the triumphal entry occurred on Nisan 10, according to the Jewish calendar. And this was the day the Passover lamb would be selected by the high priest. Hence, the triumphal entry was the day Christ presented himself as Israel's Paschal Lamb. Early in the morning, as Jesus journeyed to the temple in Jerusalem, he saw a fig tree in full leaf along the road. Since Jesus was hungry, he went to the tree expecting to find figs, but found none. When Christ found no fruit on the tree, he said, May no one eat fruit from you again. Jesus cursed the fig tree for lack of fruitfulness, and in a symbolic fashion, Christ pronounced judgment on his generation because they would not produce fruit in keeping with repentance. This event does cause some confusion concerning Christ's actions when we factor in Mark's narrative that it was not the season for figs. Even though the full harvest season for figs had not arrived, the tree Jesus saw was in full leaf, and the fruit of this type of fig tree always sets before the tree goes into full leaf. For all intent and purpose, there should have been figs on the tree of some sort. It may not have been the proper time for harvest, but green figs should have been found on this tree. The historical record also indicates that figs can ripen in Israel as early as the Passover. After the fig tree incident, Jesus went to the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple. After Jesus cleansed the temple area, he stationed himself as its guard to prevent further desecration. Jesus rebuked the people by quoting Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. This event does have its controversy. How many times did Jesus cleanse the temple of the money changers? All four Gospels record this event, but the Synoptic Gospels chronologically place this event during Christ's final week, while John places this event during Christ's first Passover. Who is right? When did this event occur? When we harmonize the four Gospels, we can surmise that Jesus cleansed the temple on two different occasions. Simply stated, both are right. While Christ was teaching in the temple, several Greek proselytes approached two disciples requesting to see Jesus. The disciples approached were probably Philip and Andrew. It would appear the Greeks sought these disciples because their names were Greek. This would indicate that Philip and Andrew were of Hellenistic extraction. It is interesting to note that the Jewish nation rejected Christ while the Gentile nations desired to see him. Once again, it becomes obvious that Jesus' own people rejected his offer of salvation while the Gentile world would accept his offer. At the end of the day, Jesus probably returned to Bethany. On Wednesday morning, as Christ returned to the temple, his disciples noticed that the fig tree cursed by Jesus was dried up from the roots, and Peter brought to remembrance the fig tree incident. Jesus responded to the inquiry of his disciples by stating, Have faith in God. Jesus also stated that the power of our tongue in conjunction with the revelation of God could move the greatest mountain. I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, 
not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive what you ask for in prayer. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests came to him, demanding he identify the source of his authority to cleanse the temple. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? This is a strange question to ask Jesus. Why would you want to know the source of his authority? It would be more logical to charge Jesus with creating a disturbance than to ask the source of his authority. Maybe many of the chief priests also believed the presence of the money changers and animal merchants also desecrated the temple. Should this be true, then why didn't these same priests do something about the desecration? The Jewish historian Josephus gave us the answer. The money changers and the animal merchants operated under the authority of Annas, the father-in-law to Caiaphas, the current high priest. Since the high priest had the authority to determine what type of offering was pure and sacred, he controlled the sacrifices being offered in the temple. It just so happens that the only sacrifices authorized were sold by the animal merchants under the employ of Annas for an exorbitant markup. The only coins allowed in the temple treasury were Jewish coins. Therefore, Annas' money changers exchanged coinage for an exchange fee nearly 10 times the market value. This bazaar was legal extortion, and Jesus knew it and so did the chief priests. So why didn't the chief priests do anything about the bazaar? Answer is simple, church politics. The priest did not want to offend Caiaphas. Jesus refused to answer the question concerning his authority until the Jews answered the question concerning John's authority. It was obvious that the authority of Jesus and John was identical. The chief priests and elders knew they were trapped. If they replied that John received his authority from heaven, then why didn't they believe Jesus' message? Should the religious leaders accept the message of John, then they must also accept the message of Jesus, since the ministry of John was to prepare the way for Jesus. The chief priests and elders refused to answer Christ's questions because they feared they would lose influence with the people who believed John was a prophet. Since the religious leadership could not determine the authority of John, Jesus refused to identify his authority. Jesus also infuriated the Pharisees by pronouncing a series of woes, and he revealed the reasons why judgment must fall on them and their hypocritical pharisaic system. Matthew chapter 23, verse 13 through 36. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you blind guides! You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools! Which is greater, the gold? or the temple that makes the gold sacred. You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? 
Therefore he who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to the people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous, and you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in the shedding, the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Others you will flog in your synagogues and pursue from town to town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. I tell you the truth, all this will come upon this generation. Christ finished his discourse in the temple with the final pronouncement of judgment on the city of Jerusalem because of its long history of rejecting God's word. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37 through 39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Toward the end of Wednesday, April 1st of 33 AD, Jesus and his disciples left the temple and journeyed to the Mount of Olives to rest. Christ's announcement of coming judgment on the city and the nation left the disciples stunned and perplexed. In the minds of his disciples, the temple of Herod was the glory of Israel, and when the temple is destroyed, the nation would fall. With these thoughts in mind, the disciples approached Jesus and asked him, what would be the signs of the end of the age? It was at this point Jesus taught his famous Olivet Discourse that has inflamed eschatology debate for centuries. Luke chapter 21, verses 5 and 6. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As to what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another, every one of them will be thrown down. Nearly all dispensational, end-time prophecy teachers quote Matthew's version of this discourse because of one verse found in the King James Version of the Bible. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? The phrase, the end of the world, could date the event described in the Olivet Discourse to the end of the world as we know it. The controversy is created when we harmonize this discourse with the Gospels of Mark and Luke. Mark chapter 13 verse 4 Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Luke chapter 21 verse 7 And they asked him, saying, Master, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when these things shall come to pass? The Gospels of Mark and Luke record that the disciples asked the same basic question. What signs would signal when these things shall be fulfilled and come to pass? What things are the disciples asking about? The context of all three Gospels clearly indicates the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Does Matthew's narration indicate the end of the world as we know it? I don't think so. To a Jew, the end of the world would also be the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, new translations of the Bible no longer use the phraseology found in Matthew's narrative, but change the word world to the more correct translation of age. The destruction of Jerusalem did occur in 70 AD by Rome under the command of General Vespasian and his son Titus, bringing to fulfillment the prophecy of the Olivet Discourse. Since the age of the Old Testament prophets, God's people have an insatiable desire to understand future events described in biblical prophecy. By studying the prophets, the Pharisees had concluded that the Messiah, riding on the foal of a donkey, would signal the restoration of the Kingdom of Israel and the end of all war. They based their understanding on the vision of Zechariah the prophet. Jesus riding to Jerusalem on a donkey foal was a direct reference to Zechariah. No doubt Zechariah does teach that this event would usher in a world of peace. Did the Pharisees misunderstand the scriptures? Partially, yes. They wanted to work the prophecy into the difficulties of current events. It's a dangerous thing to formulate a complete system of end time Bible prophecy based on our understanding of Bible prophecy. The religious educated during the days of Jesus failed to understand the messianic ministry of Jesus because his mission did not fit into their concept of end time prophecy. Let's not judge these people too hard because are we any different? We think we have the second coming of Jesus all figured out, but do we? We read books, novels and see movies describing the end times in graphic format. The failure to harmonize the Olivet Discourse between the three synoptic Gospels only shows our predisposition to a dispensational doctrinal bias. Let's not fall into the same trap that caused the Jewish nation to stumble, thinking we have the mission and ministry of the Messiah figured out. The command of the Lord is simple. We are to occupy till He comes, whenever that is. Let us never forget our primary responsibility is to a lost and dying world. Consider this thought with me. Do you study Bible prophecy by reading a book on the subject and allowing the book to dictate how you understand the Bible? How you honestly answer this question will expose the doctrinal glasses you are wearing.